Welcome to the Stonehen View, a podcast series which interviews a range of sport club representatives and leading professional sport club personnel during the COVID-19 shutdown period. We find out what these people are doing during the current health crisis with some of our most popular sports seasons postponed. I'm Mark Heenan and today I'm going to speak to a special guest who is the current and longest serving Ballerine Peninsula Cricket Association President. He is also the President of the Barwon region of the Victorian Country Cricket League. We welcome to the Stonehenge View podcast, Ian Caldwell. Welcome, Ian. Thank you, Mark, and good afternoon. Well, it's great to have you on the podcast. I've been doing this in conjunction with Mark Stone, but also this is in the summer series. So just to let you know, we're in episode 45 and it's the summer series. And I guess in some ways, you know, COVID has reared its, I suppose, ugly head again. And uh, last week you were forced to make a decision into games of cricket in the Ballerine Peninsula Cricket Association that were cancelled and couldn't take place. And a lot of other cricket associations were faced with a, with a similar fate in this state of Victoria because of the lockdown. Now, we obviously got a, a message or we've got some fresh news or some developments that we've heard that uh, this weekend or as of the lockdown, we'll, we'll uh, finalise the... the we'll, we will finalise the five-day snap lockdown. Um, so you can alert us to the, the games are on for, for the upcoming weekend of cricket and that uh, it, it's a good sign for, I suppose, to, to complete the rest of the season. It certainly is, Mark. And it's wonderful news for community sport, whether it's cricket, whether it's soccer, whether it's hockey, whatever the sport is, that we're all can go back out onto the playing field and compete and enjoy the game that we uh, love and uh, dearly. So the, the the news coming from the government it was most welcome. Last weekend, round 13 uh, was cancelled and what we've done is rescheduled that round, the same games to this weekend coming. So we don't lose any days of cricket. We just pushed the whole season back a week. Well, that's really good to hear, Ian. And I, I guess in some ways, this has been a, a gradual season in a lot of ways with developments that have happened around you know, the Ballerine Peninsula Cricket Association and you've been faced with challenges along with your fellow people that work on the committee for the Ballerine Peninsula Cricket Association and we'll take you back to what happened last season um, shortly. You've been faced with a lot of challenges. Can we just talk about this recent five-day snap lockdown and what you had to endure and how you went about contacting people because I mean you know this podcast is obviously about you know we talk to the sports players we talk to the coaches we talk to people involved in sports but you're classically uh, you know an administrator um, and a volunteer administrator as well so you have had some challenges this year in terms of an association and just tell us what transpired uh, in the last week where you called off the most recent round of cricket because of the five-day snap lockdown? It was around about lunchtime when I was alerted by one of our executive members that the government had made a decision to instigate a five-day lockdown, which meant that all community sport would uh, would cease. Then, then following that, and a very quick ring around to the executive, and we were able to quickly agree and put out the word through the secretary email to all the clubs and also on our Facebook uh, page to alert everybody in the cric in the Ballerine Peninsula cricket community due to the government's uh, directions that the uh, cricket had been cancelled for that weekend and we went into the five day lockdown. Then we're just uh, waiting for the days to uh, tick down and hopefully we'll get good news at the end of that five days, which we did, and that the community sport can um, recommence this um, weekend. Obviously, there were things that you've been in place. And one thing that we want to know about or how your role has changed as a BPCA administrator, because you, know, you would hold meeting at the Leopold Sportsman's Club. And I understand that there've been a you know, an important part of the league in terms of facilitating those meetings and, you know, helping, you know, organise sponsorship along with your other sponsors as well, like Flying Brick. But it's really important to sort of discuss that as part of what we do and how, you know, we organise this is that, yes, it's coming to on, on, it's coming to you on Zoom, but everyone's had to change the way they've done things. And, you know, ever since last year, when 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 you called off the season, there was I suppose you awarded the, the the team that finished on top of the ladder 
you know, the, the pennant winner uh, ship or, you know, they were granted them being the winners for that season without playing a grand final. And I think that was probably fair under the circumstances. But you've also had to conduct meetings, not in person, as face-to-face, where you have monthly meetings. I think your AGM would have been done on Zoom. And all your meetings since, I believe, last year when COVID broke out have been done on Zoom. I mean, how has that worked and, and how, what's sort of the feedback from the BPCA committee on running those meetings on Zoom and just uh, doing things differently? Uh, thanks, Mark. The importance of uh, still communicating due to the COVID situation is very important. You just can't stop not communicating and, and meeting by Zoom is an important part of that. Where we're able to uh, come together, have a delegates meeting and, and as you quite rightly said, the AGM was conducted on Zoom and also the meeting leading up to that, which is our rules meeting and where we trash out possible um, rule changes which will be submitted by clubs to vote to be voted on at the AGM and necessitated that to, uh, to occur. So it's nothing like meeting in, in the flesh, in a uh, room around the table, but it's important uh, aspect of that in the in the face of the pandemic um, uh, limitations that we're working with. One of the big things that you would have discussed as an association was how to structure the season. Now, I know myself being playing cricket and sort of feel like you've got two lifetimes. I've just recently started going back into cricket and, and even, uh, I suppose, in even in the last 10 years of, of being playing that you know the one-day format. Now, it, it's mandatory across all grades in the Ballarat Peninsula Cricket Association to play, you know, one-day games. Now, obviously, in previous seasons, you might have had a mixture of one-day games and two-day games. You've had T20 comps, which is completely separate with a T20. But this season, you decided to have a 14-round season, but you knew that if COVID broke out like what it just has and where we had to have a snap lockdown, you could extend the season by a week because you still had weeks up your sleeve in March to play with to host finals. So essentially, if we look at the actual fixture at the moment, and I have got it up with me, is that it's a 14-round season. Round 13 games could have actually gone ahead on round in on the 13th of February, but they didn't eventuate. So we had to, you've pushed that, back so you had the fixtures ready but round 13 is is round is the 20th of february so i suppose one advantage is ian is that you've had some flexibility with the fixture and having these one day games has also promoted the availability of players within clubs that's right mark at the start of the season we didn't start the season on time as we normally would have and with covid we didn't know what was transpiring you know what what we face during the season. So we normally have a fourteen game season, and with discussion with all the clubs, we decided to limit this season only to a fourteen game season, which is still the same number of games that we played last year, but all one day games. But it also gave us the flexibility with having an earlier finish if we got heated out or rained out due to adverse weather or due to COVID, we had the flexibility of pushing, still playing 14 games a season and pushing it back. So we felt it would be ideal to do that because if you didn't do it, you you got rained out or heated out a couple of times and and you're down to about 11 days of home and away cricket, which is not the good basis of leading up to finals cricket. So we wanted all the players to have the ability of playing 14 days of home and away cricket. So that's what was the basis behind it and uh, as a result of that four um, planning was able to swing into play and had at this stage uh, touch wood minimal impact upon the season. Without naming clubs particularly when this was brought forward as a committee that you would run a 14 round fixtured season and they were all going to be one day games and then you would have the finals on top of that. Was there any objection from any of the clubs as to whether they wanted to have any two-day cricket despite the fact that the, that you were going through a pandemic in the off-season? Some clubs are more suited to uh, to two-day cricket and, and one-day cricket. In the normal season, we've got seven two-day games and seven one-day games. We're facing a, a unique uh, circumstances of COVID where we all had to make certain decisions for the betterment of the game overall. And part of that was that decisions were made that may not have been too one particular game play of a club but everybody wanted to make certain that we all got a season in because we were in a more fortunate situation than our brothers in in community football where they ne- never had an opportunity to have a season uh, uh, last year so, so we were fortunate enough to have a season of cricket. So is the feedback from the clubs been pretty positive in the fact that that you've been able to play these one day games not only have You've got, you know, probably better availability 
I think from from memory as well, you didn't actually play the last weekend prior to the Christmas break. So, you know, so if you were a family, you could get away and you didn't have to worry about playing for your own club. So those those changes that have been made to the fixture it, what if you what what have you what's the intel and what's the feedback that you've got from clubs? well normally in in a season we've got 26 weeks of uh, available to play cricket you've got 21 days of home and away you've got two days of finals uh, there's a reserve weekend and also two day two weekends off over the christmas new year period and that takes you, gives you 26 days for cricket so with the shortened season on one day game which enabled us to have a three week break same as our brothers in the gca had but because we just started out uh, a week earlier than the uh, GCA, which meant that we went back a week earlier than, than they did. So it enabled players to probably over the Christmas period have um, more family time. So that was okay with that first week back because you yeah, were that, came that, back that, a week that earlier? That's fine. It was a value judgment where Christmas and fall was in the, in the week type of thing, you know. Mm. So you, you almost get deciding where you're going to have that start the two-week break or, or the three-week break. So uh, yeah, it all worked out very well, very good. Now, you're also the president of the bar and region of the Victorian Country Cricket League. What changes in that role have you had? I mean, obviously, if you're communicating with fellow representatives of the VCCL, that you might have done the Zoom chats and all that, but what are the restrictions been like as someone where you might have had to travel to a ground and had to abide by some of the rules, like whether you entered, say, the rooms or whatever, you've had to, have you had to go in and get some sanitizer? Have you had to do the contact tracing? What are some of the things that you've had to do when you're sort of attending those fixtures? Well, if you're attending a cricket venue, no matter whether it's in the Ballerine Peninsula Cricket Association or the Geelong Cricket Association or up in Melbourne in, or, or anywhere in the state, you've got certain um, COVID protocols you've got to follow. Scanning in, sanitising, that doesn't change wherever you happen to be. So in the role, we've had a lot more board Zoom meetings and which were the meetings a lot shorter than we normally have um, morning and afternoon in Melbourne. We were able to attend uh, two trial matches because uh, the national championships were cancelled for this year. So we've had two matches, East versus West of the state, Open A, where the selectors have invited players to come in and, and play so that the selectors got an idea of the talent out there in in, in, in the view of um, selection for next, next year. We've also uh, got the under-21 match. Um, we uh, Barwon played Northern Rivers last month up in um, Benigo. So we went up uh, Benigo to uh, play where Barwon defeated Benigo. And unfortunately, uh, the Murray Nally weren't able to fill the team in the, in the round two. We are now playing in the final, Gippsland, at the of uh, the Premier Cricket Club of the Kingston Hawks at Parkdale. So, and which is a very fine ground. So that's the Monday of the the long weekend, which is Labor Day. And obviously, by getting you on this program, that you you still play, and we're going to talk about a little bit about your sort of career playing, but also you know that there are many roles that you filled. I mean, player that is a life member of the Port Arthur Cricket Club. You're very passionate about the statistics there. You're obviously you're umpiring as well. So there's many duties that you have there. So you've got a whole host of involvement. It's also important to note that that you're actually playing for the Geelong Seniors Cricket Club and the over 60s competition and that season's been uh, somewhat impacted as well but I've just noticed a story recently that uh, the Geelong over 50 side has also hit the ground running because they're playing in a final in the upcoming weekend. Is there much rivalry between the over 50s and the over 60s and see how far you go with some of these competitions? One of the things that we've got in the two veteran cricket club we've got in Geelong, the over 50s competition, they're structured and they play finals. In the over 60s, there's no finals, and that we just play each week. And on Saturday, we've got two teams we put out. There's a midweek team we have, and we've got an upcoming competition, the Border Cup at Mount Gambier, where we've Geelong, Hamilton, Adelaide, and Mount Gambier are playing in that tournament. Then about a week later, up in Echuca, we've got a very big statewide carnival up, up there. So there's a number of competitions in the veterans cricket that you're able to participate in, as well as on the um, on the Sunday. There is a transition between to 58, 59 you can transition across uh, to the over 60s. And we've had um, a couple of players uh, who have done that recently in Tom O'Brien and Owen Brew. And that they, they are welcome uh, additions uh, to the over 60s. Now, just a quick one on that. Are there any dangers or are those competitions subject to change? Because you mentioned different towns outside of Victoria and also holding a tournament, which is on the Murray in Echuca. Can, because of what's going on with the pandemic, by bringing different parts of 
different parts of the state and also interstate. I mean, obviously, you know, some of these competitions could be subject to change, could they not? Well, everything's subject to change depending on the circumstance we're faced with. But the organisers this year up in Echuca has made a decision that all the games will be played on the Victorian side of the border. So there'll be no games over in New South Wales. Mm. So so if we had a lockdown or we had um, border restrictions inhibiting us as tr- crossing uh, from New South Wales to Victoria or vice versa, where it could take a significant amount of time. Um, that's uh, the organisers have seemed to have taken away that uh, barrier by um, having all the games in, in Victoria. Now, at last year's AGM, when you were announced as the president, you're going into another term of presidency with the BPCA, which made you the longest serving president. I, I guess two ones here is how many years have you been president of the BPCA and what did you like about being on a cricket committee? How did you, something when you were younger, why did you go down that path on being in, in, in a cricket committee and then ultimately being involved in a association committee? Is it- Good question because I first went on to administration role on the committee down at Port Arlington. Then um, I was secretary early on for a year. I was, I've had um, uh, three different terms as treasurer down there and also on the committee type of thing. It's also just wanting to put back in to the game and also to the club um, that's been good to you. You know, like to try and we are custodians and we want to be able to pass that on to the next generation of administrators that the, the, the game in a good condition or better condition than what we uh, received at, uh, from the administrators in the past. So uh, this is my ninth season as, as president and uh, and it's a role that I do enjoy. Um, we've all got a limited amount of time to uh, in, into the roles and we've got to make certain that when when we our time comes to, towards an end that we do have succession planning. I got to meet you probably more so when I was the league representative and the media publicity officer going back a few years. And I, I've got to say, um, having known you on a longer term basis since then, um, is that, uh, you know, there is a funny side to you as well. And uh, I, I like to I like to talk about that and to have a little bit of banter and I noticed you've got so many books behind you and we've just been in COVID and we're in COVID last year. And you've also got a wonderful animal that likes to strike its way around the house and outside as well. And I don't know if he's going to land on your lap in a sec, but he's a a cat, I think, by the name of Snow. That's that's its name. what, What have you done during the course of COVID that you haven't sort of managed to do because... You know, we've had lockdowns or we've had, you know, stage three restrictions where we haven't had the sort of the civil liberties that you and I would normally have in previous years. Uh, what what have you had a chance to do and um, have you learned any other skills during this period? I'd oh, say so obviously learning the skills of Zoom and chairing meetings because it's always a work in progress and during COVID uh, concentrating on cricket and administration but also the ability to um, uh, listen to some music I've got a large collection of classical music uh, which I'm able to uh, so when we talk about the musical taste we we didn't have any Rolling Stones or the Beatles in there I do have uh, the, the music of uh, my youth. I was more a Beatles person than a Rolling Stones person type of thing. But then in my youth, I was a very much a fan of progressive rock, prog rock. Then Yes and Jethro Tull and uh, Genesis and uh, all the like. Then it was a little bit heavier with um, Deep Purple and Black Sabbath, etc. And the music taste is very wide and I can also sit down and enjoy jazz and the blues. And just give us the quick version of how that uh, famous... Uh creature with white fluffy hair landed in your lap and landed into your way of life he was uh, born next door and um the the tenants of the house next door were moving out and 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 he was spending a lot of time over in my place and and they asked me if i would like to send him spend a lot of time there would i like to have him take care of him in a moment of hesitation um of he's uh, now become um a very much uh, a valued member of the household. And I also understand too, and this was pre-COVID because I saw you in a few trips when I went to the library um, just in Geelong in Belmont. Uh, you were quietly uh, putting on a spreadsheet of all the Port Arlington Cricket Club statistics. And it's incidental that uh, one of the legends of the current day environment, Paul Pudgy McGrath, is uh, I believe, well, he brought up his 10,000th run. Obviously you would have been doing a lot of that statistical data towards that. So that's been another pet project that you've had going for a while as well. It, it, it has. I've been able to do a Excel spreadsheet for every person who's played a senior game of cricket 
at Port Arlington, whether they played one game or whether they played over 400 games type of thing. So, so every player has got their own individual spreadsheet and it's broken up into the grades um, A, B, C and D and, and the totals and the uh, so across to the number of batting, uh, number of games, innings, as runs, and where uh, people uh, fielding in the catches, and and this is wicket keeping, stumping is applicable, and also bowling, and the number of overs, maidens, runs, wickets, etc. And the spreadsheet includes um, strike rates and economy rate type of thing. So uh, it's all been um, drawn upon there. So in, as you said, recent time when um, Paul passed the milestone um, of 10,000, and North um, a few weeks after he took his 700 uh, senior wicket. And so he's definitely the best cricketer we've had down at Port Arlington in um, the history of the club. Yourself too, you've uh, taken around about 400 wickets and made 5,000 runs. So uh, you don't need to boast your statistics too much, but um, I guess in some ways, uh, finding out about your statistics and pulling it all together, it's uh, over how many years you've been getting that information and um, is there any highlights that come to mind with your own personal career as well? Participating in a and part of what we have affectionately known as the icebreakers is that the, in the D-grade premiership team back in 1977-78, first premiership we had at Port Arlington for 17 years. Um, we won that on the Saturday in the one-day comp. Then um, uh, also over that weekend, we won the B-grade uh, and the uh, A-grade um, premierships as well. So We also had one of your fellow Medal Honour recipients that's been on this podcast as well in... Robert Malcolm from the Drysdale Cricket Club and Shane Cutterjar was helping me. Well, he was a co-sponsor. We also had Nick Hallaman on and last week we had Dale Kerr on from Anglesey, a star player who's, uh, you know, his strike rate with the ball is incredible. I think it's less than 16, for every 16 balls or just under he gets a wicket. So his strike rate's unbelievable and he's been a leading wicket taker in the league for some time. But uh, can you describe us back what what was it like back then? And I mean, it was before I was born, seven seventy seven seventy eight. What was your long? Was your hair really long? And were you driving a Holden Kingswood or what? Well, when I came down to Port Arlington, I had a one twenty wide Datsun, and it was a great little car. It 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 was um it was it was fantastic. It was, it, uh, it had a lot, got a lot of mileage up uh, and the like. So we all had um, longer hair in the in the past uh, that then what sometimes uh, pe- people don't have the option of uh, uh, of keeping it or whatever just nature takes over oh, I think uh, you're doing pretty well <laughs> no but uh, but uh, they everything was sort of changed the grounds we got at the moment are absolutely we've got some fantastic yeah. uh, grounds um, in fantastic conditions the different grass so Santa Anna, Santa Anna grass with us on at um, Anglesey it's in at Winchelsea Port Arlington Drysdale and it's, it's absolutely fantastic and, and also uh, the other grounds with the the, the quality of the surface today is a lot better than it was um, 20 years ago 30 years ago or even 40 years ago when I first arrived at um, uh, down in the uh, at Port Arlington. You've also got a medal named after you, and the reason why I mentioned Rob Malcolm is that there is the Rob Malcolm medal, which is, I think, be a part of the BPCA uh, representative game, but the Ian Caldwell medal's uh, a grand final medal as well. I believe it... Is that for the B grade? It's the the A2... A2. A2, uh, A2, A2 player B, of the year, A, cricket yeah. of the year. Yeah, so that's a bit of an honour for you, isn't it? And how long's that been going? That's been going. This will be the third season, type of thing. So, uh, mm. uh, so it was a, uh, an honour when the um, uh, the executive mate uh, um, made that recommendation to the delegates, and it was in, endorsed um, along with the others, type of thing. So, and and Robbie Malcolm has been a fantastic advocate for representative cricket, and it's only fitting that the Robbie Malcolm that will go to the uh, uh, the player of um, uh, in representative matches type of thing. So whether we're uh, able to get back next season with the game against um, Colac, which we've instigated, and I've already spoken to uh, informally to Gisborne, um, whether they'd be interested in playing representative matches against the um, uh, the BPCA uh, type of thing, and also uh, back in Country Week. So we've got a fantastic leader um, in Benny Grinter, who, who's got a passion for representative cricket and, and he's a fantastic leader on and off the field. Um, and 
and we're in safe hands there. So he, um, following in and along the footsteps of um, uh, uh, people like uh, years ago and Robert Warren and Stephen Long, uh, type of thing. So who, um, who were fantastic leaders for the association. You've got two rounds to go with the BPCA, uh, particularly if you look at A1, and Anglesey has been the standout, and the round 13 and round 14. And fingers crossed if there's no delays or there's no more lockdowns that the finals will be played on Saturday the 6th and Saturday the 13th, the grand final will be played then. Have you got any update on the venues where the grand finals will be played? Exactly, if you're in the process now doing an inspection, and so what we'll do is we'll pick um, uh, 10, 10 grounds um, on, a, on a rating and from those 10 will be uh, uh, shortlisted to eight because we've got a new uh, criteria which was endorsed uh, at the AGM this year where the, uh, the executives will rate uh, uh, eight grounds and um, then uh, they will allocate the grand final to, uh, to um, to the two teams and try and eliminate a little bit of the travelling. Uh, uh, you know, as a hypothetical, if Barrable and Anglesey make it through to the A1 grand final, um, there could be Jan Jack or it could be Winchelsea, to, depending as a couple of alternatives uh, and the like. So, um, but no one club will be able to play a, uh, a, a home final on at home. Hmm. So it'll be all the mutual venues. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ian, it's been an absolute pleasure to go down memory lane and talk about your experiences as in all facets of cricket, whether that's umpiring and playing and then, you know, having your name as uh, the A2 uh, Man of the Match performer or Man of the Match award to have the name Ian Caldwell medal. So it must be a huge thrill. But, yeah, obviously we want to... Thank you for coming on the uh, the Stone Angu podcast just to talk about some of the challenges you've faced as an administrator, particularly with the Ballerine Peninsula Cricket Association, because that's obviously your main role. But you've got, you wear a few different hats and you're still playing and, and you're in the over 60s competition. And you, as I said, you're still umpiring. So really wanted to appreciate your time on the Stone Angu podcast. It's episode 45. Make sure that uh, the, the decluttering or when I've been around your house, um, you know, it might be a good chance to throw out some stuff, but just make sure that the cat gets looked after too. Snow is he is the boss, as most people will know. Uh, that uh, six thousand years ago, the Egyptians worshipped the uh, cats as gods, and and they haven't forgotten. Well, there you go. If you've thought about what the end part of this podcast is all about, well, then Ian Caldwell has described it to you, relating Egyptians and cats in the one sentence. So. Thank you so much for your time, Ian, on the Stoneham View podcast. And we look forward to an exciting end to the BPCA season of 2020-2021 in the coming weeks. Thank you, Mark. And um, all the best to all uh, participants out there as they reach the so-called pointy end of the season. And the best luck to everyone who plays finals and those who make it through to the, to the grand final. Yes, Ian, should be exciting time. So you can get in contact if you have a guest in mind from sport. You know, if you want to look at some advertising, we've got some room on our banner here for any of the sports clubs or sponsors of the sports clubs. Uh, if you're a cricket club and you want to touch base with one of your local sponsors, to, um, we can get a guest on from your club and have a sponsor. So you can check us out at any time on the Stonehenge View. You can type it into Facebook and go onto Instagram. We're going to be uploading the video with Ian Caldwell on episode 45 on Facebook and Instagram with our IGTV. Our podcast is also available on Apple Podcasts. So remember to write us a review, particularly even on Apple Podcasts. We're on the launching platform of Podbean. So it'll go up on Podbean and Spotify. And the Stonehenge View also has a YouTube channel. And this uh, episode will be going up on YouTube as well as a Twitter account at Stonehenge View. So at Stonehenge View is the Twitter address. Until next time, it has been episode 45. It's been a great delight to speak to the president of the Ballerine Peninsula Cricket Association, the BPCA president, in Ian Caldwell. It has been a great time to talk about some of the things that he's done in his life with cricket and the challenges around COVID. So until next time for the Stonehenge View podcast for episode 45, we'll talk to you soon and bye for now. Thank you. Thank you.